is um, one of the yoga teachers here. She teaches um, through the wellness um, program here, and I've had the good fortune to attend one of her yoga classes, and it is an amazingly calm and zen experience. Anjali Rao is teaches the candlelit yoga here at, at the hospital. She is a survivor herself who believes that yoga is a great tool to have in the healing process, and it connects the mind and body in a more holistic fashion. She teaches yoga in gyms and studios in the Bay Area, and she's now doing her advanced yoga teacher training to specialize in yoga for cancer and other chronic illness. Please welcome Anjali Rao. So much for the introduction, that's very kind of you. And uh, Dave, amazing speaker, and you have touched my heart so much. And uh, to follow up in your footsteps is going to be something. Uh, it is such an honor to stand here uh, in front of so many survivors. It's the first time I'm actually talking as a survivor. I've been very open with my journey with people I know, my family, uh, my friends who are here. Uh, but I've never really spoken about it because, and I'll tell you why, in an in a open way. But uh, Laura, thank you so much for this opportunity. She is an angel uh, who has designed such a fantastic, holistic, uh, inclusive program for uh, the community here. And we are that. We are a community. We are a reluctant community here, cancer survivors. Uh, and, and to form that community is not an easy task in today's world. So she's done it mindfully with, uh, with a great intention and with great heart. So Laura and your team, thank you for this opportunity. And, and I was going to give a shameless plug for my class, but, but I've already got that. <laughs> so I would hope to see, and I see one student here too, uh, candlelit yoga. I believe in the power of yoga for, uh, for connecting mind, body, and spirit. And I will talk a little bit about that. But uh, I see the faces of my children here, um, my uh, husband, my sister, brother, brother-in-law, and my best friends who come here, one from Napa, so I think she's a little drunk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for coming. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I'm here. I'm 43 right now, and I was diagnosed at 37. Uh, which is around six years ago, almost to this day, uh, that I was diagnosed with breast, early stage breast cancer. Um, I'm a bit anxious too to share this journey to a room full of strangers, uh, because to share a journey which is so private is uh, making myself vulnerable, uh, making myself open up some wounds which I think are now own scars. But I realized that you have to uh, show courage. Uh, there is courage in showing your vulnerability. There is a courage in being open and real and human and present in what you are feeling and going through to another human being without whitewashing it, which we are all encouraged to do. Right? So there is a great courage in sharing your journey, even if it is sometimes not a very pleasant story. So um, I hope by sharing a part of my journey, it will help to light up some of your own. Uh, journeys here as cancer survivors. So here we go. Like I said, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer and I remember that, and everybody remembers their stories of their, first, their diagnosis, right? I mean, it's like, what happened when Kennedy was shot kind of a thing. Uh, I remember I had three things on my list. One was to get my teeth cleaned, get my first mammogram, and uh, go pick up the uh, dry cleaners. I remember doing that, and I remember thinking, yeah, it's done. You know, it's just a first base, baseline mammogram. And I got the call saying, you know, there are some things that don't look really good. Uh, go for a checkup and go for another checkup. And, you know, the whole slew of checkups followed one after the other, and I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. Uh, and I realized that my whole world sort of came crashing down my ears at 37. I mean, really, who gets breast cancer? Uh, well, now I know that a lot of people do get breast cancer. Uh, and I thought I was in the best shape of my life. I, I do drink, now I know, but uh, that wine 
I do drink a little bit more than a glass of wine, actually. <laughs> but uh, I, I was a pretty healthy person. I, I, I've always been very fit. Uh, eaten, I've eaten good food. I've lived a good, healthy life. So how could this happen to me? And life day there, I'm a creature of reason. You know, the Asian <laughs> science. That's me. So I searched, I went into Google. I know I shouldn't do that again. That's something which I will not let a lot of people who could come to me as uh, for counseling do right now. But it's a part of the process of seeking answers. It's a part of, it's a part of seeking reason and finding an understanding of what has happened. You know, so I went to uh, the doctors. I read up. I researched. And I could diagnose myself. Um, I knew what was happening, and um, I knew what I wanted to do at 37. And I talked with God, I talked with experts, I talked with whoever I could talk with. And I realized that I want to go and go and go big. So I went in for a bilateral mastectomy. Again, a lot of people in, in our communities, especially the Indian and the Asian communities, don't really talk a lot about it because, oh, the word breasts, ooh. But, that's something that I realized that I have to be an advocate of, that we have to understand that we are more than our body, that the, that the woman is not defined by the presence or the absence of a uterus or an ovary or a breast. We are more than that, right? So for me, that kind of changed some, some of my internal dialogue about who I am as a woman. And a few people have helped me along the way to come to this decision. And like Dave said, I mean, I go back to what Dave said, that every single time I have, uh, come to a part of my journey, a crucial part of my journey, people have stood up and shown me the best part of themselves. I remember being uh, figuring out what is the best course of action. Should I do a bilateral mastectomy? Should I do a lumpectomy? And I remember the two women in a hospital who were my nurses, who, was, who they were doing my biopsy, and they said, hold on. They closed the door, they turned to me, and they both had done the mastectomy. And they showed me. And I said, oh, wow, those are look pretty, pretty good. They're actually looking better than mine right now. <laughs> <laughs> Two breastfeeding, yeah, I'll take that. But, uh, but anyway, so that, that, was, that was such a part that touched my heart. Because and at that moment, I, I mean, it's pretty dramatic, but it was a dramatic moment. Because there were two women who were showing me their parts of their journeys and sharing with a complete stranger, which they really didn't have to. And I realized at that time that I am not going to let this define who I am, that I will actually uh, help another woman decide or be with her decision, whatever that decision is. Uh, that I will be an advocate, not only for myself, but for the, I will help another one to lead to her path. Oh, I know I have a PowerPoint here, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, before I go to my, to my three L's, the big C happened, and the, when the big C happened, the big cancer thing happened, I did, I had surgery. And I remember coming back after surgery, after a mastectomy, and I told my parents, and I told my sister, give me three days, right? Give me three days, I do not want my children to see me in pain. <clears throat> give me three days. Take the children away. I want to grieve, I want to scream, I want to do whatever I need to do, but I don't want them to see me. And so they said yes, and they took them away. And I was naive, and I think there's a, there's a certain degree of courage in being utterly ignorant. <laughs> I got grief, I can finish it, like a mom, right? There's an end period and there's a beginning period. I start day one grieving, I start I end the day three grieving, right? So after three days, I'm like, oh, all right, I'm done with grieving, now let's do this. Um, I, I, took, I took a minivan, right, in, in the first two weeks of my uh, healing, and we drove to Oregon. I drove. I never drive. I hate driving. I'm a bad driver. I am the stereotypical bad Asian driver. <laughs> <laughs> so I took a, took a minivan, and I drove my parents from India, my children, and my husband, because I wanted to show that I can do it. I drove all the way to Oregon, met with friends, and wanted to be as normal as possible. Little knowing that the normal has changed. The normal changes. The minute the word cancer enters your life, the normal changes. And it's okay. And it's okay. 
So I will, I can never honestly say, I cannot say that I'm grateful to have had this experience. No, because there are so many things that have been taken away. I've lost innocence. I've lost an innocence in, in my own mortality. But, but I have gained so much. I've gained such a deeper understanding of what you, the human condition is because of what has happened to me. And I cannot presume to say that this is a blueprint for everybody here. Every one of us here have their own learning from their own experiences. So I cannot say that this is what everybody should do. But I, I endeavor to say that this is a small piece of what my journey and my learning is. And I'm just sharing it with you again in the hope that it will help you to figure out what your meaning is to your experience. So here we go. The three L's. The first one is live with an intention. Second one, live a life that matters. And the third one is live as if you've been given a second chance. So in yoga, we have what we call as sankalpa. Sankalpa is a Sanskrit word. It's, it means an intention. Live a life that and every practice, you, we, we, we begin a practice with setting some intention in your mind. It could be just something like, work, be with your breath, calm your mind, uh, work my booty, uh, anything. It can be anything. It can be just be the physical thing. It could be, the, it could be a mindful thing. It could be a spiritual thing. So if you take this off the mat, I've learned that it's, it, work, it has worked for me, that I want to live a life with intention. And what that means is that I want to live a life that will help myself nurture my own mind, body, and spirit. It will help my students and whoever I come in contact with help nurture their mind, body, and spirit. So by body, I mean, you know, as, as cancer survivors, we experience a sense of betrayal almost, right? What? Me? I have cancer? That doesn't really happen to me. Why would it happen to me? Why me? Why not me? Right? Life is random, is what I know. And cancer is randomer. Right? I know there is a whole lot of research, and I, I'm all for research. We also know that there are a lot of things that we don't know. So my thing is, get back into nurturing your mind by exploring different parts of you. Learn different skills, talk to different people, uh, explore the different parts of, of the community around you. Uh, so nurture my mind. I like to read. I like to go talk to, just talk to your neighbor who is completely different from you. Um, so that, that's, that's something that I've really worked on doing uh, after my cancer. And the sense of betrayal that you come from your, with your body. For me, yoga has helped me to connect back with my body. There are, like I said, there are many things that I cannot do anymore. Right? But there are many darn things that I can do now, that I will do now. And I want to connect that back with myself. And I want to help the other uh, women who are going through this treatment or uh, survivorship to connect back to the joy that their body has given, will or can give them. I remember that the, the day I first started yoga was because of a pasta bottle. I couldn't open it. And I tried everything. I tried a rubber band, I tried hitting it, I tried cursing at it. <laughs> Nothing really worked. And uh, I drove myself to a yoga class and, because I wanted to get upper body strength and I fell in love. That was a, I actually learned yoga in the US. I've never done yoga in India. Um, so I, I fell in love and I said, this is what is my calling. And I want to share this calling with other women who are going through surgery and chronic illnesses. And because this is one way I can really feel that the, the, that the person who's going through something can connect their mind, because I see that mind is a huge part in the healing process. Huge part in the healing process. There's a lot of research now I know that can back this up, that mindfulness and meditation and yoga practices can help in the healing because it reduces stress levels and all the good stuff starts increasing, all the bad stuff starts decreasing. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so technical right now, I know. <laughs> Talking to a room full of surgeons, but that, that's what I understand. Um, so anyway, so yoga has helped me to connect back with my body. So my suggestion to you would be learn to connect back with your body, even if it means to go on a walk or to go on a cycle bike ride or uh, take a Zumba class. It doesn't have to be yoga, though I'm hopelessly biased about yoga. Uh, go and do something which will give you that joy back in your body. Continue to grow. 
and take to, take time to get to know the new, new you because not it's you're not the old you anymore. You've changed. So accept it. Accept the change. Like I said, the normal is not normal again. You are changing the definition of what normal is. And ride the wave of the spirit. And what I mean by that, I, I know it sounds all foo foo, but but what what I actually mean by that is that you will go, and I did, that you know that whole three day grieving process that I did? It's a whole bunch of baloney, right? <laughs> you don't grieve in three days. You grieve, God knows, whenever you, whenever you feel like grieving, or whenever you feel that angst and the anger and the questioning, or whatever you feel like, it, whatever comes up, comes up at a time that it's supposed to come up. So we can't really time human emotion. Uh, we can't really have an expiration date to our feelings. So for me, I have learned that and yoga has helped me to really be present with that, whatever that feeling is, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, this whole cult of positive thinking that we all aspire to is not real. Because to be only positive is, 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 is declining all the other things that are happening in you. You are angry, you are depressed, you are, you are whatever you are feeling, resentful, whatever it is. Be with it, acknowledge it, look at it in the face. And then you will see that you it will pass. But at least you've dealt with it, you're not repressed. This is the stuff that has worked for me. I'm not saying it worked for you, but this is what has worked for me. Live a life that matters. And I think this is, again, one of the key things in the attitude that Dave was referring to that has worked for me is that the way we live, live our uh, days is the way we live our lives. It's a simple concept, really, right? What is our life really made upon? What is what is the what is the what is the thing that makes it up, right? It's the the, the days. How do we live our days? Who do we live our days with? Uh, so go find your tribe. In yoga, in in the Vedic philosophy, there is this concept of the sangha, right? So the sangha mean is the community that is surrounding you. Who is that part? Who is a part of that community? Who lights your fire? Who stokes your fire? Who holds your hand? Who can you be real with? Who can you be annoying with? Who can, you know, who will kick your behinds a little bit? Make you do things which, which are probably good for you but you really don't want to do. So go find your tribe and, and be that tribe for someone else. Be that safe space for someone else. Uh, that, that has helped me the most because I realized that, that I'm not just, it's just not me. It's, it's, there is, there is a whole another world out there. So it's not just my issues and my stuff. It's a whole another world out there that, that I can engage my mind and body and spirit in and make a difference. So make a difference somewhere, somehow. Even if it is just a little bit, even if it's just a, that old neighbor down the road who is alone, probably, go and talk to him and say hello. That's something that I try to do sometimes. Uh, it works, and sometimes people sometimes look at me a little strangely, but that's fine. Uh, and this is one of my favorite books, Siddhartha, uh, written by Herman Hesse. Uh, and it, this is one of my favorite things that I, I try to hold on to, that happiness is really, is a, is a how. How, it's not a what. It's not what you have or what you don't have. It's how you live. What's your attitude about, about whatever the, lives have, uh, the challenges that life has thrown you. So for me, and I, I, I'm an unhuman too. I mean, I don't hold on to all this stuff every single day. I, I'm, a, I'm a mom who yells at her kids. I'm very bossy. Uh, I, I yell at my husband, or my, I, I get annoyed with my sister and brother and my friends or whatever. So it's not like I'm Buddha, but uh, but I try to live it with intention and awareness, and I try to get back. So in yoga, we have a bhyasa. Bhyasa is practice, right? You got to go and you got to practice, and you got you got to just keep at it. And sometimes you will not be able to do something, but as you modify and as you understand the needs and the varying needs of that, ex that specific pose, uh, you will change and your body changes and your mind changes. So you go back to your practice. And in, in yoga, there is, a, there is a really awesome saying that says practice and all is coming. Everything will be revealed. Everything will be okay. Everything you will be where you, wherever you need to be, and it need not be where the other person is, but you will be where you need to be. So believe in that. 
live as if you've been given a second chance. And I've thought about this very much because I do work with people who have cancer. I do understand that there are a lot of people who don't get a second chance. And to me, the second chance is a random privilege. It's a privilege that has, that has been given to me as a survivor. I don't forget that. I don't forget that there are people who don't get this. Um, and every single day, I, I look at myself and I say, oh yeah, there's a gray hair here, or there is uh, you know, a wrinkle here, or a scar there, which has happened because of surgery. And then I realize that that means that I'm alive. My stretch marks, my scars, my gray hairs, my aching bones sometimes, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 that, it's that I'm alive. So every challenge you're given, it's, it's a chance to grow. It's a chance to evolve. It's, it's a chance to go to the next level, probably. So that's my, those are my three L's. I will not say that these are absolute truths. I don't think there are any absolute truths anymore. Uh, our life has, you know, everyone of our lives have different meanings and different purposes, uh, different truths. All I know is that every day matters. So make your life matter the way you want it to be. Thank you. Okay.